the official start. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to uh, Greg Dean's forum number five. And uh, last time I talked about uh, forum number four, I talked about uh, putting ambiguity into setups and stuff. And uh, so this time, uh, people actually wrote and asked, oh, you just kind of shortened, you know, put the ambiguity in and kind of shortened it. Well, how do you go about doing that? So I thought I would actually go through the process that I actually have for looking at things and making them shorter, uh, especially setups, because that's what we're after. So this one's called writing shorter setups. Uh, and that's what we're going to kind of cover. If at any point anybody has any questions or uh, comments, uh, please put them into chat because I can. I only have a matrix at the top of the screen of about four or five people, so I can't see everybody if you raise your hand or something like that. So if Steve uh, will get the uh, information and let me know. So here we go. I am going to uh, share with all of you. Here we go. Wow, that was a resharing again, too. Okay, here we go. All right. So here we go. Okay, so welcome to uh, Forum 5. We've already went over all that. And also... Uh, here's what I'm going to do today uh, with everyone, which is uh, what I find it, very important that you take my joke structure some way or another, get it out of my books, uh, do one of my on-demand classes like Joke Writing Made Simple, take one of my other classes. Everything for me starts with joke structure. So you want to, people say, well, how do you shorten jokes? How do you rewrite jokes? How do you fix jokes? All of it all starts with joke structure. It really does. So that becomes uh, the real point is that once you understand the mechanisms of joke structure, then you can do almost anything with jokes that that model allows you to have so many other skills that we'll talk about here, some of them right now. So uh, here we go. Uh, Back to this. So joke structure. So um, a lot of people don't realize I coined the term joke structure. Uh, it, it, I coined it uh, many years ago, uh, 10, 15 years ago, to explain the mechanisms that connect the setup and the punch. Uh, it's in setup and punch aren't joke structure in my world. They're just one way. That's the way we express one-liners, by the way. Uh, we also express humor through one-liners and through sketches and through cartoons uh, and through sitcoms and through movies and through poems. Mm, you know, setup and punches is, is uh, one of the ways we express humor. So uh, we can call it joke structure if you want to. It's fine uh, to some degree. So first of all, we're going to have the... I'm going to introduce you to three of the mechanisms right now, okay? And it's kind of a, a, here's the first one. At the center of everything for joke structure is one thing with two meanings, okay? So one thing with two meanings. Very important for you. This is the ingredient that helps to really define joke structure, okay? This is required that at the center of all places where we laugh at humor, not laugh at tickling or nervousness and stuff like that, but we laugh at humor, moments of humor, there's always one thing with two meanings or interpretations. Now, what, uh, what the setup does, the setup establishes the expected meaning, one thing with two meanings, okay? One of those meanings is the expected setup that will come from the uh, setup, and the punch will have the unexpected meaning. Now, this triad, these three, these three mechanisms are really important because that helps you understand joke structure. If you don't get that, I mean, there's a lot more going on inside of jokes than just these three things. Yet, the, these three are required. So it's a place to go to, uh, to begin 
to start identifying jokes and understanding jokes. This is where I get everybody to start. So these three things. So one thing with two interpretation, one, uh, one of the uh, interpretations or meanings is expected. The other is unexpected. Okay, so now this helps us. Uh, first of all, there's a couple things you can do, which is first, you can identify jokes, okay? Identifying jokes, and you can also fix jokes. Those are the two things we'll cover today. So let's, for right now, we're just going to identify jokes. I'm just going to show you how to do this, all right? So here's uh, Emma Willman. I worked with her privately, and uh, here's her joke, and then we're going to identify it. Look for the one thing with two meanings. That's where it all starts. Here we go. I've got ADHD. I was diagnosed in high school and I was prescribed Adderall, which was a godsend because my grades were able to skyrocket because I could finally focus on trading my Adderall for the test answers. <laughs> That's what happened. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at this. She said my, gra my grades skyrocketed because I could focus on Okay, trading uh, my Adderall for the test answers. So, what's the one thing with two meanings? Anybody got it? Put it and put it in chat if you got it. All right, here we go. Here it is. It's what she could focus on. That helps you understand the structure of this joke. What she could focus on. Okay, when she got the Adderall. All right. We had the expected meaning. What she could focus on was studying to improve her grades. Okay. Where the unexpected meaning was that she could trade the drugs, Adderall, for cheat sheets. All right. So now we start to understand this joke because of joke structure. These mechanisms at the center of this are the three things you look at to start to really understand jokes because it's really hard to fix jokes or, or work with jokes at all if you don't know where the joke is, where the joke is, or the where the joke gets lost in overwriting things. All right. So uh, any questions about that? Uh, raise your hand. Let uh, Steve know. Okay, here we go. We're going to do another one. Here's my student, Anthony Jesselnik. Here's one of his good jokes. My brother's crazy. Even my neighbors hate him. The other day I opened up the door, I caught him masturbating. He looks me right in the eyes and goes, shut the door. <laughs> I said, get inside. All right. <laughs> so, my brother's crazy. So, here's the... Uh, the breakdown of this one as well, you know, he says, he, uh, he said, uh, shut the door. And I said, get inside. So of this joke, what's the one thing with two meanings? Anybody, anybody, if I just turned into Ferris Bueller's uh, teacher, anybody put it in, put it in chat. Oh, 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 what is it? Here we go. It's where the brother was masturbating. Where was he at? We assumed the uh, uh, the expected meaning was he is in the bedroom, his bedroom. Where was he actually? The unexpected meaning of where he was was outside where the neighbors could see him, which kind of explains why they hated him. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions about this? Because that's the the uh, that's the first step to this whole thing is starting to really understand joke structure, understanding those three mechanisms, understanding that there's always one thing with two meanings, one of those meanings is expected and the other is unexpected. That helps you start to see jokes. See, this is part of my system that I use for correcting jokes and working on jokes, et cetera. So uh, no questions or anything so far, Stever? Okay. No, sir. All righty.
Here we go back to it then. So here's the joke we're going to work on today. Uh, we're going to work on right now. I know it's the same one I worked on uh, last forum, but now I'm going to take you through the whole process of how to. First, we need to identify this joke. That's what we need to do. Okay. And uh, so the joke itself is, I just went through a long and messy separation, which ended in a divorce from my wife. So after all that, I went on a vacation to Denmark because I was having a sex change. The punchline from very seldom to not at all. Okay, everybody calm down. All that laughter is killing me. All right. Here we go. So now we have a joke. And uh, so let's look at here are now it's uh, okay. Now let's identify it. The one thing we do is sex change. Does everybody follow? That was uh, the, the meaning. Okay. The expected meaning, unexpected meaning, a change in sexual frequency. Now, once we understand what this joke's about, you've got to get those two parts. You've got to get the expected meaning and the unexpected meaning. So we know how to, especially the expected meaning, to know how to write or rewrite the setup. That's the idea is first identify the joke itself. Where's the joke at? So we got all this long setup to just establish the change in sexual organs. Okay. Wow. That's a long setup. All right. So now that we've identified it, okay, so these are uh, the, the uh, setup guidelines. Setup guidelines. Okay. Uh, you, now, these are guidelines that, that are part of my classes. I've not really put them out there on video or to the public in general before. So here they are. Here's a, a, a setup guidelines. Using, you, uh, uses only, setup only uses one idea, one main idea. A lot of people get lost by trying to put too much in a setup. Okay. It must contain or indicate an ambiguity, which we talked about last forum, which is one thing with two meanings. The job of the setup is to establish the expected meaning of the ambiguity, which is used to misdirect. It's the misdirection. The next one is, is the setup concise with fewest words to establish that expected meaning? That's its job to establish that, but fewest words possible. And it's best if it ends with the ambiguity. Uh, we'll talk about that later, maybe about uh, processing how quickly the audience uh, can solve that puzzle. Uh, every joke is like a little puzzle they have to solve because they're getting two, two uh, interpretations or two meanings of one thing. So let's take these one at a time. Let's look at the setup, okay? Does it just use one idea? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> That's a lot of ideas. That's way too many ideas for a setup. That's the first thing you need to do is look at it and go, Whoa, wait a minute. Wait, your audience is just going to get lost in all of that excess information that's not relevant to the joke. Okay. So that's the first thing we do. Okay. Next is, whoops is it must contain or indicate an ambiguity. Well, yes, it does. It's got sex change. Okay, we know that because we've already tracked that by identifying the joke. All right, good. Next is uh, to establish the expected meaning of the ambiguity. Yes, it does. It does there. Okay, there it is, expected meaning. Wow, it does that correctly. Next, the fewest words possible. Well, no, not really. It's really overwritten. And the last thing, does it end with the ambiguity? Uh, actually, this one does. Even though it's overwritten, it does end with that one thing with two meanings. Okay. So that's what you kind of do is go through and track and look at this for, uh, to know what, what are the what are the guidelines for writing a good setup? And those are the five. If you can follow those five guidelines that we just laid out there, you will write really good, short, crisp setups. Now, 
a lot of people say, oh, you mean for one-liners? Yes, I mean for one-liners. I also mean for storytelling, for observations, for opinion pieces, for late night political jokes. It doesn't matter. Uh, what I find from years of teaching is as soon as you tell people, oh, we're going to go into storytelling, they think, oh, great, I get to add a whole bunch of extra stuff that I'm seeing in the story. Uh, and all it does is clutter up the jokes. It makes the jokes harder to understand and, and uh, make the jokes work. So for me, I, I, I'm always, no matter what you're doing, you're always keeping setups short and punches short. Uh, and, and in storytelling, it's still really, really super important to keep them short uh, because there's a lot of, you know, you're setting up uh, uh, in storytelling, you're setting up situations, you're setting up characters, uh, you know, and actions and things happening and maybe multiple people, environments, all those things. So the question comes down to what, of all those things that are inside of a story, what's relevant to the joke? What's relevant to the joke? And I just gave you those five, uh, those, those five, I, I call them guidelines. I call them guidelines, not rules or any of those kinds. I call them guidelines and I do it very specifically because guidelines for me are mostly true. <laughs> That's why <laughs> they're there to guide you. They are not absolute. None of those things. There's only a couple of things in comedy that are absolute. One of those is that there'll always be one thing with two meanings an expected meaning and an unexpected meaning. That's always going to be the case in jokes. That's a law. That's a rule. Okay. Because that's what defines, helps define a joke. These other things really help you write good setups. And that's what we're after today is writing good, tight setups. So let's go back. Here we go. So we're now here for fixing setups. That's the other thing that you can do is fix setups once you understand joke structure. So let's uh, let's just focus on the setup. We don't need the punch for right now. All right. Here's our setup. As we discovered earlier, it's way, way overwritten. So how do we go about figuring this out? Okay, we're going to fix this joke. Okay, I have a five, five steps for editing setups. This also has never been put out into the public. This is a very, very powerful five steps. If you're just looking at the setups, how a, a process for going about looking at them. Okay, so we got to identify it first. But then what we do, once we have it, we're going to examine one part at a time. Sometimes it's a whole sentence. Sometimes it's just a, 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 a phrase. You kind of have to figure it out. Sometimes it's the whole joke. But one section at a time to kind of figure out what's going to be needed and what's not. Next thing is ask the question, uh, uh, what is not needed if it's overwritten? What is not needed? And, and this setup still work. It still does its job of establishing that expected meaning. Uh, then you're going to edit that out. Then you're going to identify what is still needed to make that setup work. And then, if necessary, rewrite it. And the last is repeat the steps as you go through different parts of the joke. Because, you, you know, you're, you're, you're going through it. You need to comb through a joke many times. See, I find that, that this idea of... Uh, a lot of people have that uh, you write a joke and that's the end of it. And that's what I find, uh, especially beginners and some mid-level comedians stuff. They write a good joke and that's the end of it. The comedians that I know that, that have, are quite famous and that I've talked a lot with about things, they go over jokes over and over after every performance, sometimes for months. Steve Martin talks about going over and, uh, he experiments with a joke for three to six months before he knows really how to make it at its funniest. 
wow, that's Steve Martin. So a lot of times what happens is people write a good joke. Now, I got a good joke. And then they don't go and investigate it. They don't look through it. They don't sit around and go, how can I cut it shorter? How can I make it more crisp? How can I make it easier for the audience to understand? How can I improve it in some way? And there's a lot of techniques for those as well. Okay. So uh, that's what we're after. The other thing is, is, is tagging jokes, which we're not going to talk about today. A lot of times people write a joke and uh, oh, that's it. Where with my students, I teach them, you write a setup and a punch and then you tag it and tag it and tag it and tag it and tag it. So that way you can get to uh, five plus laughs per minute, which is a, a professional level. And my beginner comedians, most of them perform at five plus laughs per minute because they know what a joke is and they know to not stop working on that joke when they've written a good joke. That's just the starting point. So here we're going to go with this a little bit more. Here we go. Okay. There are those five, uh, six, sorry, so it'd be six, six steps. So the first one's examine a part of it. Here's our setup. So we're going to pick a part. We're going to pick uh, the first sentence. This is the whole sentence, okay? Got two, two uh, parts of it. We've got that. All right, so let's look at this, okay? Uh, I just went through a long and messy separation, which ended... Uh, and, uh, and a divorce from my wife. Do we need to say all of that? First of all, do I need to say that it was a long and messy separation? That's one of the ideas that we don't need to have in there. Okay, so we're going to uh, ask yourself, what is not needed? Okay, well, that's not needed. That part of it is not needed. Okay, well, why didn't it? Uh, there we go. That's not needed. And from my wife, if you get a divorce, pretty much it's going to be from a spouse of some kind. So that's just part of the joke. Okay, next is edit what is not needed. So here we go. We are going to edit it down from here. We got divorce, okay, in there. Okay, we've got that. So now all we really needed was divorce for the, that part of that setup. Okay. So identify what is still needed. Uh, what is still needed is uh, after all that, which kind of puts a time frame on it. After. So we just can't start that setup by going divorce. <laughs> so <laughs> we kind of got to take this part here and add it to that. So, and then we come into here and that means we should uh, uh, rewrite it. So here we go. We're going to rewrite it. There it is. Oh, so that whole part of that setup, that long thing, all we needed to say was after my divorce. See, this is the grunt work of learning to be a comedian and write. People don't sit down and just knit pick a, a setup and a punch over and over again. Oh, look what I've got this down to so far. And I've still got some more to go for the setup. So let's uh, repeat the steps. It's okay. Repeat the steps. We come back, examine a part. Okay. So this is the part we're going to examine. And we're asking, we're going to ask, uh, what is not needed and this uh, the setup still work. So what is not needed? Uh, almost all about, oh, I don't need to know that you went on a vacation and went to Denmark. I don't need to know that. That's what I call rationalizations. You're rationalizing the reason that you had a sex change. The joke doesn't need you to do that. The joke, does, that's not part of the joke. That's part of the performer's mind. Oh, I feel like I got to tell everybody why. No, that's the kind of stuff that really clogs jokes up and then creates problems later on. Okay. So edit what isn't needed. We're going to edit that out. And what's still needed? Well, we need to say, you know, they had a sex change. Oh, I was having a sex change. Oh, okay. That's what we need to kind of keep. 
But again, that's awkward language. So if necessary, rewrite. All right, so we rewrite it. After my divorce, I had a sex change. Wow. Now there's a tight setup. Do we need to go over the steps again? No. There's our setup. After my divorce, I had a sex change. All of that comes down. Now, there isn't any more in this than what is needed. Okay? We set, set the context, and we, we, we got the ambiguity in there, and the, the expected meaning is all established by that setup. So let's go over this. Let's look at it. So uh, now, here are the guidelines. We're back to the guidelines. Does it you use one central idea? Yep, it's got one central idea. You know, does it can contain a, a, an ambiguity, one thing with two meanings? Yep. Does it establish the, uh, the expected meaning? Yep. Okay, uh, what was this one here? Is it concise? Well, we went from there to there. Yes, that's concise. It's a very, very precise, okay? And the last thing is, does it, it, does it end with the ambiguity? Yes, it does. Wow. So those are all, all of the uh, uh, guidelines. So first we identified the joke, said, oh, what's going on inside this joke? Then I went over the five guidelines and used those to shorten this joke. And at the end, it fits all those requirements, okay? So that makes this a really tight, and, and so it's a process of going over this and doing this many, many times, okay? So the, the full joke is after my divorce, I had a sex change from very seldom to not at all. There you go. And there's the structure of that joke. So that is my quick little uh, introduction to two different uh, 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 models, as it were, for things to do. Uh, first of all, identify the joke, understand its structure, the, 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 uh, the one thing with two meanings, the expected and unexpected meanings, just so you know what the joke is. And we could do the same thing with the punch. Same thing. Usually punchlines are way overwritten. Same thing. Identify what the, what the unexpected meaning is and pare down the punchlines for that as well. Okay. So once you can identify a joke, you know, oh, that's, that's you know, that one thing with two meanings. Oh, okay. I know what these two are. Now I'm going to make the joke, the setup fit the, you know, uh, 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 establish this and the punch, communicate that. Wow, that really helps. And then there are my, uh, uh, the, uh, the set up uh, guidelines of those. When you know those, you go over each one of those. And if you can check all those off at the end of it, you will have a tight, crisp one. So why do I want it so tight? Okay, so I'll talk about this, and and I don't talk about it very often because uh, I a little bit, but for everybody here to get a joke, for your mind to get a joke, as best I can lay it out, your mind goes through twenty six different steps or phases to get a joke. It's constantly, so every joke is basically a puzzle. So here's how the uh, humor theory puts it is, it's called the incongruity resolution theory. Uh, I chided them about it, uh, the International Society of Humor Studies, uh, a friend of mine, Sa uh, Salvatore Atardo, who's at Texas A&M Commerce, and uh, said, look, I, I don't like that model because it ignores the setup. So they turned it into setup incongruity resolution. So basically a setup, okay, the setup uh, puts out an expected, that expected meaning. And the punch, punchline, 
gives you that unexpected meaning. Now, here, now, that's the incongruity. The audience then goes, oh, wait, there's a mistake. There's a mistake that's been made. That's the incongruity. So, uh, so uh, what they need to do, though, now is resolve that incongruity. So they go back and look all over through the setup until they figure out where the mistake was made, resolve that incongruity, and if they find humor in it, they laugh at it. Okay? So the more debris you put in that setup, when they get that incongruity and they need to resolve it, they're going, they are having to go through, you know, if you got all those ideas that we originally did in, in the one, they're trying to figure out where, where, where they made the mistake. And finally they run into, oh, sex change. Oh, okay. Oh, 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 sex change. Oh, I thought it was a, a change in sex organs. It's just change in sexual frequency. They can resolve that incongruity. That's why jokes need to be short. Because the audience just gets lost in all the debris of those multiple ideas and cluttered information to get the expected meaning, get the unexpected meaning, and then go and find out where the mistake was made, resolve it, and then if they find humor in it, they laugh. Lots of steps the mind goes through. So uh, that's the reason, one of the, that's why especially setups need to be really, really as short as you can make them. Not, not any shorter, but as short as you can possibly make them. And most people think that they need to write a lot of, that's the point of those, uh, 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 those guidelines. If you, can check, if you can do that checklist of the guidelines, uh, you can check those off when you're writing your setups you will write a really, really tight, tight setup. Now, uh, when I publish this video, there will be a uh, link uh, in the description so you can go and get uh, that checklist of the, the checklist of the five, I mean, the, the, uh, the setup, uh, uh, the, the setup uh, guidelines, geez, okay. That's nothing. Else. Good setup. Put them by your computer when you're writing setups. You sit around and go, oh, I'll go to each one of them, make sure it's at that checklist like I did, and then you'll be writing really good, powerful, short, specific setups that establish that expected meaning because that's its job. So uh, that's the end of this lesson or these ideas and stuff. So we will, Stever, open it up to anybody have any questions. Um, nothing on the chat. I do have a question from YouTube, if you want to take that real quick. Uh, somebody's on YouTube watching us? Yeah. Well, how much fun is that? Right. Okay, I will take that. All right, the question is, um, I write a lot of jokes, and it feels good at the time. But when I'm fixing them and, and uh, yeah, fixing them, I don't think or feel as well anymore. Is that normal? Yes, that is normal. In other words, jokes are about the surprise, right? So once you understand that a joke, you know, that's the whole point of the the uh, the unexpected meaning, right? That's what creates a surprise. Oh, we thought it was uh, sexual organs and it ends up being sexual frequency. Oh, mm. now that surprise when you first come up with go, ah, that's kind of, that's funny. All right, and then you start writing it shorter and making the punch shorter now, writing it, rewriting it, rewriting it, it no longer surprises you. So you're like going, well, I don't find that funny anymore. Uh, and you will find a lot of comedians who do not find their entire show not funny anymore. <laughs> Yet, and this is one of the reasons that, uh, that I've established uh, joke structure, my joke structure, of uh, the mechanisms that connect the setup and the punch. Because for me, a joke needs to be defined by structure. Okay. Most people, they define it going, I find it funny, or the audience laughed at it, or those are just everybody's opinions being expressed. 
We cannot have a definition based upon everybody's differing opinions. You can't have a definition like that, okay? So my definition is one that of structure, one thing with two meanings, an expected meaning and unexpected meaning. If it has that, at least it has the prerequisites to be a joke, and that helps you identify it. So my suggestion to you is go back and remind yourself that, oh, that setup establishes a really clear expected meaning, and the punch reveals a very unexpected meaning, okay? And to have the confidence in that, to get it up there and put it in front of an audience so that you can start getting the feedback that it is indeed a joke and it works for you, your personality, your delivery, all the other things that change. So that's why I always always tell people, for me, all good stand-up comedy from all my training, all the training that I do, and I do a lot of a lot of things that I, I teach people, it all starts with understanding joke structure because that's what you have to rely upon to sit around and go, okay, it's a joke. <laughs> Because a lot of people say, well, it's not funny. To who? Uh, a guy in my class the other day said, oh, you know, we, he wrote a joke. He said, well, I don't think it's funny. I said, well, right. Then you wouldn't perform it, even your own joke. But if we gave that joke to a heavy set comedian, that'd, that'd kill. That would get a huge laugh. And he was like, yeah, you're right. It would. Oh, yeah, I see. Well, it was a good joke. Okay. And I'm going, you wrote a good joke. Is it right for you? No. That's why it's got to be about structure. Because if it's about funny, you're, you're lost because you're always trying to figure out everybody else's opinion of what they think is funny. We can't do that. You can't rely upon that. What you can rely upon is, well, like I tell all my students is, uh, I can never guarantee an audience will laugh at your jokes. What I can guarantee is that what you're taking on stage are jokes. Structurally, they are jokes. And that includes tags are jokes and have joke structure as well. So that's the best we can do uh, at the beginning. And then after that, it's experimentation and uh, trial and error. You know, keep going with the ones that get the laugh, edit them and, and uh, make them better or edit them and write some more. There's that answer. Anything else come in? Uh, yeah, uh, Don here with us has a question. He said, any comments on the use of callbacks? Callbacks, yes. Callbacks are uh, taking basically, uh, well, callback. Callback is basically taking uh, an earlier joke from uh, oftentimes within your own show and putting that joke into uh, another context later so that it, uh, <sighs> or sometimes it's uh, using the joke from, or a, a reference from somebody else's show earlier in the night. Uh, it can also be a callback. So that that's a boy. That's a very complicated thing. That's kind of a, a an a extension of tags. It's one of the forms of tags. Okay. So uh, what you have to do is you, you got to set. It's a complicated. You you have you have a joke that later you realize oh in this other context it still it becomes yet another unexpected meaning. I know that's a little complicated, but you know, you've already had one unexpected meaning. You put it into an, another context and, and it has another unexpected meaning. So uh, use callbacks a lot. I mean, use them when you can, because it ties the whole show together, reminds the audience of the funny things you did earlier, etc. You can use a couple in a show. Uh, one good one a lot of times is great. I always found that the best place to, you know, my favorite place to kind of do it, if I could, was to close a show. You do a really great callback as the last thing you say of the night, and it gets a huge laugh calling back something. It's a great way to get off stage. 
So there are my thoughts on callbacks. Uh, anything else, Steve? Okay. Yeah, I think question. question. Yeah, Greg, I had a question on something that you touched on uh, this past Wednesday. You mentioned that uh, as far as setups, suppose you already have, let's say, a possible punchline or a negative opinion or a commentary on something. There's a way that you can kind of uh, reverse technology or, or you know, back, <laughs> back solve retrofit a setup that would work for it. And is that a different seminar altogether? Or is that something you can address? It is here? a different seminar altogether. Okay. Yet, let me see if I can give it a quick right. shot. Uh, jokes have two patterns, essentially. They uh, set up and punch if we're doing those one liners. They go from good to bad and from bad to worse. Mm. OK, so I find that a lot of times people will write something negative. OK, like well, that's what happened the other night. I said, well, so and so they're they're, they're uh, uh, I forget what it was. They were a, a very negative thing. And I said, OK, let's go back and write a very positive setup that has an, uh, uh, an ambiguity in, uh, in common with what was happening in that punch. Okay. Kind of a complicated answer. So we, you know, as a group, because it was a writing session with the entire uh, level two classes, we all went back and forth a few times and started talking about it. And then amongst us all, I wish I had the example, I wish you had the example of that as well, that we went back and wrote a really good, clean uh, setup, which led to a false uh, uh, expected meaning. And then the punch they'd already uh, written chat was the uh, another was the un unexpected meaning so that, that's a good thing about understanding again back to joke structure i can look at it and go you got a punchline here with something negative let's go and write a positive setup okay uh or at least a, a more positive setup still can be bad but you know a more positive setup but you've got to have got to find that one thing with two meanings and we look and I point that out, got to have that. And when we had that, then we kept phrasing it and phrasing it until uh, we actually wrote a setup for that particular negative comment, kind of a punch. It was a punch. So I remember it was just a negative comment where they were they were thinking that negative comment would be funny. Uh, but it wasn't because it was just a negative contact uh, uh, comment without a, a, a without a an expected meaning as part of the structure that we did we didn't have that triad there wasn't one thing with the, the expected unexpected they just gave us possibly the unexpected meaning we had to go back and restructure a setup that had the expected meaning of something in that setup so that's why it's a little harder to kind of teach that and work with people on it but yes, that's a really powerful technique. I use that all the time in, in writing with my students and stuff. But you're right, I should put together a seminar on that as well. It's so another really good idea. Right. Thank you. And anything else? Uh, I got one more on YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. How and when do you sit down to write? Do you take notes? Uh, well, if you really want to be a comedian, the answer is all the time. <laughs> You're writing all the time, all day long, every day, every day. When you know, in the shower, uh, I've got, I've woken, I've, I've stepped out of the shower, wrote down notes. I've uh, woken up at night and wrote down notes. As I go through the day, uh, you guys are lucky. You got a cell phone. You just kind of, you know, click, click it and have, you know, you can go to Evernotes. I like, I'm not paid by them, but Evernotes I used to use to organize all of my notes and 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 put together routines and I'd have them on my phone and things. Uh, but when I first started back in the 70s, it was just a little notepad and a golf pencil. And I always had it, those in my back pocket. And an idea had come to me, I'd pull it out and write it down. Because if you don't write it down, you will forget it. I guarantee it. Because creative memory is a lot like dream memory. It's really vivid right at the beginning, and then it fades really quickly until you can't recall it at all. And if you don't, you'll remember having had the idea, but you won't remember what the idea is. And it'll drive you crazy. Uh, 
I still think of one joke from a long time ago. I didn't write down and I'm still, damn, I still have, you can see me right now. I'm mad at myself for not writing it down at the time. So record, get on there, record, record every little idea, no matter how insignificant, how silly, how whatever, get it out of your mind. One, it gets it out of your mind. So your mind can now think of other things. Two, it's recorded. So you can go back for it later when you're going, oh, now the other thing is uh, the, the other half of that or portion of that is I say, as far as writing goes, I ask my advanced students, I ask all my mm -hmm. students to give me 10 minutes a day, six days a week, okay? 10 minutes a day, six days a week as a ritual, okay? As a ritual. There's a really good, a couple of really good reasons for that. Uh, first of all, you get in the you get in the habit of writing, and so when you don't write, you feel like there's something wrong after you do it. They say create a habit in like 21 days. After you do it for like a month or so, you you know, wow, I, I didn't do my writing today. It'll feel like odd. Ten minutes a day. So if you don't feel like writing that day, you just sit there for ten minutes. No, I don't want to write today, but just sit there. When I first started, I moved to uh, to Los Angeles uh, from Modesto, California. I moved with a Volkswagen Bug, 700 bucks and a box of books on comedy. And I got this really crappy place in downtown Los Angeles for $80 a month. And I had in there, it was a card table, an old Underwood manual typewriter, index cards, and a phone. That was my office. I had a chair too. So, <laughs> and every morning, every morning I would get up and I had to write, and I did this for three or four years. I had to write 10 jokes a day, uh, Monday through Thursday. And on Friday, I'd go back and look at those, you know, 40 jokes and clean up the ones that were good and type them on to an index card and file them in my filing system today. I still have hundreds and hundreds of really bad jokes <laughs> and physically on bigger cards i put the physical bits that i wanted to do and stuff like that so i mean i still have that i mean it's part of it's part of my library now and people go my god what are all these and they pick up some of them early days they look in there and they're jaded they go this is horrible yes it was why am i good at writing jokes now Oh, well, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing badly until you get good at it. That's what it comes down to. And you got, if you, if you really study my, uh, my joke structure or any of my joke writing systems with, I've got two or three, uh, it really gives you a, a process to come up with jokes every day. And then you'll develop your own process as well. So whatever it is, that was my ritual. And I did that for years. Uh, and eventually I became a really good joke writer and I go back and look at the early ones and they were terrible. Okay. And it's okay. That's okay. That's part of the process. That's with anything that you want to be good at. You're not going to be good at first. So it's the ritual, whatever ritual works for you and fits into your life. The other reason is I want you to do it as a ritual every day, a little bit is because I read this recently in a, a neuroscience, uh, article, was that what they're finding is uh, sleep. Now, one of the, the, the uh, major functions of sleep is to solve that day's problems if it can. Your unconscious mind is putting together things in your brain and a bunch of other things, trying to solve that. So when you wake up the next morning, feel like I have a clean slate, as many people have found, oh, the next morning, oh, God, well, of course, there, there's a solution right there. Well, now it's a fact. Uh, they, they actually got testing on it and stuff. Okay. I don't, you know, I'm a, kind of a, more of a science guy. I want to read the neuroscience on it before I always knew that that was the case for me. Okay. Now I read a, a paper on it says, yes, this happens. This really does happen to a lot of people. So if you write, you know, almost er or every day, a little bit, while you're sleeping, your unconscious mind will do about 50% of the work for you. While you're sleeping, geez, there's a deal for you. You know, what are the job? 50% uh, uh, of the work gets done for you while you're sleeping. Okay, you know, 
security guard. But most people, that just doesn't work that way. All right. So, but with you, if you're doing it, you wake up the next day. And if not that day, maybe a couple of days later, something you couldn't solve. All of a sudden now, oh, there it is. There it is. Day after day after day. But you got to do it every day. You can't just go, oh, I'm going to put in two hours on Sunday. You're going to be productive for 10 or 20 minutes. <laughs> that's a that's a bad game to play with yourself. 10 minutes a day, six days a week. So you're forcing yourself to work an hour a week. I know, I know that's overwhelming. It's terrible to have to put in a whole hour on your dream. But there it is. Anything else, Steve? Um, one question by uh, Don again is, uh, what's a tag? A tag. Okay, a tag. So you've got a, a, a setup and a punch, okay, for one-liners. Or pretty much any joke, but, you know, you know you've got, a, got the setup part of it. Anyway, so you got a tag. I mean, a punch. A tag, a tag is another punch on the end of that punch without a new setup. Uh -huh. So if you want to get an audience on a roll, what you want to do is go set up, punch, tag, 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 tag. Right, right. Okay. And they're usually very short little bursts of something, not a long dissertation of something they're they're quick and short watch gary shandling is was always really good at it. almost technical uh to watch him uh gosh there's so many people that do such a good job of that i can uh bill burr does a lot of great tags in stories right as he's telling a story and you know, if you stay you know and and it's hard to watch people that are that good because you kind of got to stop after every joke when you analyze those people because they'll pull you into their world so well so so beautifully that you won't be able to analyze the joke <laughs> kind of got to stop it after every joke go yeah what went on there let's watch it again let's watch it again because if you watch the whole routine i yeah i even have a hard time analyzing things i the only way i could do it is stop it talk about it you know i have a friend there that goes oh well, look what's going on there he's doing this okay Etc. So start watching people that tag and start to understand how they do it. But again, tags also are jokes. They have an uh, a one thing with two meanings, an expected meaning and an unexpected meaning. They have the same structure of them. A lot of people think, oh, tags are just comments. Uh, that can work in some places where the audience really wants to laugh more at a really good joke and you give them any excuse, they'll laugh because they're it's building up in them and they don't you know they want to laugh more so any comment will possibly work as a tag but you put a real joke in there it'll get a huge laugh and you put a real joke into the next tag it boy you can really build that and get an audience on a roll really nicely with it so good question thank you thank you thanks anything else steve -er? i think we should. go ahead all uh, right um, well so um i'm back my Aaron. Um, oh, how's your dog? You about, hmm? How's your dog? Oh, my dog is good. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I know you talk about, you know, the direct, the joke structure and I'm just, I've read, uh, I have your book, which I'm, I'm reading now and the comedy Bible, which if I recall, is a kind of a different structure. It's more like, what do you hate? And then your act out, I think like you're, you know, I hate this. And then you do the act out and you get your jokes on the act out. Yeah, so that's, I, that's mm -hmm. not, uh, that isn't joke structure. Okay. Those are formats. Okay. A little format that she put together. Oh, I hate this and do an act out, even though act outs aren't necessarily always part of it. What, from my world, because I was trained in a certain way, is that it's a fundamental uh uh, when you get past the uh, content and you start getting down into the structure of what makes it work, if it's simpler for you to think, oh, I hate and do an act out, uh, okay, or or uh, the setup is information, well, well you know, uh, it's like oh, the setup is information, uh, and then the punch is about surprise or whatever, it, 
doesn't lead you, my mechanisms will lead you to the very specific thing that misdirects. That's the difference as a mechanism. Like we, I showed earlier, if you do oh, information and surprise or expectation and surprise, it doesn't really lead you to the specific information. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, a joke like my grandfather died a peaceful death. He died in his sleep. Uh, of course, the uh, passengers uh, on the bus were wide awake. <laughs> okay. So what's the, okay, then you start to identify that joke. Okay, you got to go oh, joke structure in that. So it's not information. It's writing it out so that the whole audience, so the whole audience buys into the target assumption or the, uh, the expected meaning that uh, he died in bed. It's where, you know, because the one thing with two meanings is where he died. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. Where did he die? We thought he died in bed, expected meaning. Where did he die? Peacefully, though it was, was while driving a bus, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So now you can look at that and go, oh, I know the structure of that joke. Information and surprise doesn't lead you to that kind of specificity. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, They're more general. What I find most of those are is uh, what they're what they're calling structure is really expected or, or uh, dis- I'm sorry, desired results. Desired results of a setup is expectation. Desired results of surprise uh, of a punchline is surprise. That's a desired result. That's not the structure. Only mine actually, in my person, in my opinion, is the only one that actually teaches structure. That's why. Uh, uh, get into one of my little things. I go on, on, on YouTube and everybody goes, oh, here's joke structure. And I'm going, well, I coined the term some 15, 20 years ago to describe the mechanisms that connect setup and punch. And now all these people are out there going, uh, joke structure, setup and punch. <laughs> uh, it's, and, and it's confusing for people, okay, until they actually read my stuff and look at my stuff. But mine will lead you to specific and, and and when you learn also joke structure, there's a ways of writing jokes, and it leads you right down the path of how do you yeah you know, how do you have a setup and then you you know what your expected meaning is and then you write an unexpected meaning idea and that gives you the idea for the punch. Oh, now you can write jokes at will as well. So, uh, joke structure. My jokes. I always tell people my joke structure because it has the mechanisms in there. And they're really mechanisms of how the mind works. Uh, and that's not just, uh, I, I did this on my own over, you know, like 15, 17 years of figuring out what a joke was. And then I took it to the International Society of Humor Studies, which is a world uh, conference of, of uh, PhDs from all over the world who do nothing but study humor and presented my stuff. And they were very kind to me. They said, uh, wow, this is really nice. You, you have added nothing, nothing new to joke structure or what they what they called humor theory. You've added nothing to humor theory. Yet, based upon your model, you can teach people to write jokes in like under five minutes. Because the model that I have, because it leads you to specific information, you can learn, go and wait until you get to the end of uh, chapter two. Uh, which is the joke writing system that's in the book. You go, wow, actually, once I know those mechanisms of, of joke structure, it really does allow me to write jokes pretty much at will. Yeah, that's how powerful it is. And then you'll start to understand it, it, when you read the section on uh, storytelling and POVs, points of view. Uh, there are three points of view inside of uh, every stand-up comedy show, three possible points of view. Uh, And then you'll start to understand joke structure in storytelling. Joke structure is joke structure, but the way it's presented, joke structure is presented in storytelling. It's far more complex because you've got so many ways you're communicating to an audience in order to find the jokes and structure the jokes. I know that's kind of vague yet, but that's what it's kind of about. So 
Now, with that said, read all the books. Read them all. They all got some things in it that are, and, and some of them have my stuff in it. <laughs> hmm. So <laughs> read all the books because they all have something to say. And maybe it'll, the way they put it clicks better for you than my very technical uh, approach. People, when I put out my book, people said, your book is very technical. And I went, yeah, I know. It's a book of techniques. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it's technical because that was the whole point was to put out the techniques, not to get lost in, 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 uh, the desired result or the content of something that get lost in those is, is, you know, model it out until you get down to the level of a real technique and, and, you know, what is the criteria for the technique or techniques? So, and make those clear as well. That's why everything I teach has a definition. It, you know, because the definition is usually the function itself. There's, oh, this is the name of it, but the definition, this is what it mm -hmm. does. It actually does in the human mind. Usually it's in the human mind was, because as far as joke structure, I've invented kind of language for it, but I didn't invent this. I just identified it. Okay. Uh, I've identified that how information, how the mind kind of tricks itself uh, by making assumptions, and then once once you know what people are assuming, you can mess with them. <laughs> That's a simple version of joke structure: either make them assume something, or notice that they've already assumed something, jump to that punchline, and surprise them. Okay, that's that's short joke structure right there. All right. So those are the two basic skills that people have been uh, comedians been working on since they were children. You know, most of them, it's they're identifying what everybody's assuming and they jump to the other part and they just play that game. It's a mental game they've been playing since they were children. People just go, people say, oh, they're just naturally funny. OK, you can call it that, but it's still learned. I watched my nephew develop a sense of humor and go and visit my brother. Uh in Northern California once a year. And then I'd watch his son each time I come and see him, he's working on another, another series of skills that help him be a funny person. Some of them are creative skills. Some of them are comedy skills. Some of them are both, but he played these games and, and they were just verbal. They were just games that he played as a kid, kind of trying to learn, but he also learned, Oh, these could be funny as well. So I, I'm sorry, P, you know, people say, Oh, you've got it or you don't, or, you know, it's a gift from God. Well, okay, but what isn't? <laughs> if you believe that, <laughs> everything. So uh, I'm just saying that the, the sense of humor is learned in this lifetime. Babies do not pop out of the womb and doing one-liners. They cannot make humor on purpose until their mind develops to the point where they can identify when other people are making assumptions and have expectations. Not until their mind can do that can they make a joke on purpose, okay? And there's a lot of big difference between kids are funny and pe some people are just funny, uh, but they don't know why. A lot of people say, oh, they take my class. Oh, people tell me I'm funny. It's usually because you're making some mistakes that you're not aware of and people are laughing at you. Okay. I don't you know. They come in and try to do stand-up comedy, but you're going to have to learn to find out why you're making them expect one thing and then uh, giving them giving them the unexpected meaning in order for them to uh, to be surprised. So uh, I forgot what the question was, but I think I covered it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anything else, Steve? No, I think we're good. All right, one last thing from me here. Uh, get that out of the way, and we're back to this. And so, uh, people keep asking me, "What are the things that that are available that I have available for everybody?" So, uh, first of all, everybody, if you found this helpful, please, when you see the video, uh, subscribe, like, sh uh, share, comment, do all of those things. Really helps out one way or another. Uh, even even in this live stream, please do the same thing. It, it, you can find out almost everything you need at stand-upcomedy.com. One, drop by there and get my free book, my ebook called 10 Steps to uh, 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 
top 10 stand-up comedy secrets. That's just free. Uh, I have free blogs also that you should read. There's a lot of really great information in my blogs on the website. Join me on YouTube on Greg Dean Comedy. Subscribe, be a part of that. You know, there's a lot. I got 200 videos out there. A lot of great information there. I have the level one classes uh, where you really do, you learn the uh, whole, all these fundamental techniques. And there is a video you can watch that's free as well that kind of covers what you're going to learn in those classes, in that class. Zoom, it's on Zoom as well as uh, in real life. We've got both Zoom and live classes. I have a series of on-demand classes on Teachable. One of them is an introduction to stand-up comedy. There's another one called Joke Writing Made Simple, which is the joke structure and the joke writing technique, the joke prospector. Uh, the next thing, is, we, I teach how to be an MC. There is a video that teaches you to how to be an MC is a fast track. Once you get some material and stuff, you're doing open mics. Oh, just be, if you become a really good MC, everybody's going to want you to perform. I want you to be an MC because the MCs are so awful. You become a good MC, it really fast tracks your whole career because people are going to want you to perform and you get to perform really quite often. And the last thing is uh, 10 steps to be a working comedian. Uh, that's a good one to take at the beginning, too, because it lays out the entire path uh, of what all the things you need to do if you want to actually do this for a living. And many of the things in that 10 steps to be a working comedian are things you should be doing now at the beginning, especially all the stuff about building a business and social networking. Uh, because you can't you can't be a comedian anymore today without a good web presence. So with all that said, I would just say thank you all for coming here and uh, laughter is contagious. So uh, uh, pass it on. Thank you all very much. I'm going to check out. And uh, hopefully I'll see you at the next one. And Tony, I'll see you in class. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Bye, guys.